Hey, me? Hey. <laughs> I'm Amy. Good morning. Let us pray as we go deeper with God. Loving Heavenly Father, as you speak to us today, help us to listen well, to know your will for us in our lives, and be able to align our hearts with yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever been in a play or been in a nativity as a child? I was Mary. I must have been about three or four years old. I remember being so pleased that I got the lead role. I do think that the only reason I was picked was because I spoke the loudest and made the most noise. <laughs> Peter was a fisherman. It was the only role he had ever known and it was what gave him purpose, even if his ego and his troublesome nature got in the way. I can imagine he could have been a better fisherman if he'd applied himself and spent a little less time causing trouble and more time in that boat. His life was turned upside down when Jesus called him to give up everything and follow him, then to find himself back at the beginning. How would we feel if we were given a role that we were not ready for? How is being an adult but the child of God any different to how I was in my role as Mary? Not really any experience, but what God has called us to do, but being called all the same. How can we use this story to examine our own denials of Jesus, the role he has for us? the repentance of our sins and reaching our full potential for the glory of God. At the beginning of John 21, Peter has been out on the boat with the other disciples fishing for breakfast. When I was looking at this passage, I will admit that I was thinking about bacon and eggs. Um, I know that that wasn't available in the day of this passage, but it was a very hungry task. They weren't really catching anything until Jesus said, put the net over the other side. And they caught more fish than they'd ever before. For me, it imagined that it introduces the passage that I'm going to talk about, about Peter and his new calling. As they gathered for breakfast, Jesus had a public conversation with Peter. After Peter had been so public in his denials, Jesus doesn't call him Peter. He calls him Simon, son of John, saying, do you truly love me more than these? It was reflecting back to when Peter denied Jesus, he claimed to love Jesus more than the others. Jesus doesn't call him Peter because he didn't live up to that name. Jesus is reminding him in this place that he must face the fact that he denied him, the man that he called his rock. Jesus did not ask if he was sorry or will you promise not to do it again. Jesus challenged him to love. Jesus asks each one of us primarily for our hearts and the rest will follow. Jesus asked the same question two more times, the same number of times that Jesus was denied by Peter. Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know I love you. With each response, Peter needs to examine what brought him to sin against Jesus, to deny him and save himself. Jesus' death was not to save himself, but to save the world. Peter is saying, by saying that I love you, Lord, he's opening his heart to Christ, and that he's loving him with the best love he is capable in his sinful human form. In Luke 23, verse 36 to 37, the soldiers were mocking Jesus. They were saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Even if he could, his plan was never to save himself. He always knew what his purpose was, and it was time for Peter to know his and grasp it with both hands. Peter was really hurt that Jesus would even ask these questions. 
Peter knew what he'd done, but he wasn't ready to examine it. How many times have we sinned and not acknowledged it to ourselves and to God? How is this showing God how much we love him? That we've sinned, but said to ourselves, it's okay, God will forgive me anyway. In Acts 2, verse 37 to 38, it says, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. This public challenge and restoration was for Peter to pay attention, to see his point of failure for what it was, and for Peter to set his eyes on the work ahead, to leave his past behind him, his past full of trouble and his careless nature. Peter was so bold and brave, but it had all fallen away to nothing as Jesus was led away in chains. His whole existence, everything he was and now is nothing without Christ. He denied knowing Jesus to save himself from the cross. In his renewal, so was his love for Jesus renewed. In this moment of his own death, many years later, he would die with utter faithfulness to the Messiah and Lord. Peter is probably feeling really hurt that Jesus would even ask these questions to him. But he still wasn't ready to think about it and analyse it himself before Christ challenged him. Whilst Peter is reflecting on what Jesus is saying, he warms himself by a charcoal fire, trying to bring himself some level of comfort in this public grilling by Jesus. Jesus is calling him to examine his denials, turn away from them and publicly reaffirm his love and loyalty to Jesus. Until this happens, Peter cannot assume his new role. The barrier created by his failure and sin must be removed first. We have to do the same. We have to turn away from what separates us from God. Jesus died for us, and this removed the barriers that stood in the way of us having a relationship with God. However, this is a relationship that needs to be taken care of. Just like you might nurture your friendships, so must you nurture your relationships with God. It will hit rocky times, but you must acknowledge your mistakes. You must repent and say sorry for what you've done and mean it. When Jesus died on the cross, the disciples were likely thinking a kind of what do we do now kind of thing. There have been so many occasions during their time with Jesus that he talked about his death and resurrection, but they didn't take him seriously. And here he was appearing to them on the beach. I've experienced some of that confusion myself, hearing and experiencing God's call in my life. There have been many times where I've had to re-examine my true intentions on how I interact with the world and how I serve in his name. It has to be always about the glory of God and not about, and about the extension of his kingdom. But I can honestly say that it's not always been the case. However, I bring this to God each day. He will restore us, help us determine how our actions reflect our love for him. Peter's actions did not, and he had to acknowledge that before he could be ready to accept the role that God had intended for him. In this dramatic moment on the beach, Jesus describes the type of death that will greet Peter. He talks about arms outstretched to signify the crucifixion. He acknowledges he knows that Peter didn't want to die that way, but it will be to the glory of God asking Peter again to follow me in his ministry and indeed his death. At the point of Peter's death, he asked to be crucified upside down as he did not feel he was worthy enough to die the same way as Jesus. Jesus, in his restoration of Peter, is not just about his welfare or his confidence, but rather what it means for his early church. So Peter is repurposed, he's returned to the true will of God for his life. Part of loving and following Jesus is loving his sheep, helping them grow, being responsible for their well-being. 
When we commit our lives to serving God, we commit to serve the church too. We need to ask God what it looks like for us as a church and as individuals. When we accept God into our lives, we accept his church, the church he sacrificed himself for. To be clear, though, this doesn't come without trial, without challenges, and without triumphs. But this should be done in the name of Jesus. Just like Peter, we will be restored to a newer, more infinite purpose. Peter experiences a renewed commitment to being a follower. His life as a fisherman of fish is over. His new life as a fisherman of men and women had begun. As Peter accepts his new purpose, like ours, it will come at a cost. Peter in his death as a martyr and us in our sacrifices, our losses, leaving the old life behind and the old purpose behind. Peter will follow Jesus to his death, carrying his own cross. Peter's will for himself will be overridden and he'll be led to a place where he does not want to go. The path is not always the path we want for ourselves. Following Jesus is not easy. We are led to live lives not of this world, but to live in the kingdom of God. In trusting Jesus, Peter the Rock was restored and his witness and leadership would be the foundation of which the early church would be built. In the Greek translation of this passage, there are two loves mentioned. Agape, which means unconditional and sacrificial love. And phileo, a love of friendship. These describe the two types of love that Jesus wants Peter to show in his new role. One in taking and caring for lambs and sheep, and the other knowing the lambs and sheep. The sheep are still Jesus' sheep, but Jesus wants Peter to share in the taking care of them, leading them and coming alongside them. Jesus asks us to share in that ministry too. As this passage ends, Peter turns to John, the disciple who Jesus loved, and said, what about him? Jesus redirects Peter back to his own returning, rather than focusing on John. He said, whatever my plan is for these guys is nothing to do with you. You just focus on you. Peter represents most of us in this situation. We find it easy to defect any personal challenges from Jesus by wondering and worrying about what others are doing and what Jesus may require of us. Our unique and personal relationship with the Lord is for us and us alone. How it progresses is based on our commitment and prayerful life, not to be influenced by others. God is inviting us to a specific path, not to live vicariously through others. In life, we live by faith, but in the new kingdom, we will live by sight. Just looking at the ministries of Peter in his returning and John's lives and ministries, they will be very different. Peter, a shepherd, John, a seer. Peter, a preacher. John, an author. Peter, a foundation witness. John, a faithful writer. Peter, dying in martyrdom. And John, in old age, in peace. Peter is being invited into a partnership with Jesus, just as we are, uniquely commissioned all deeply loved and cherished, never far from God's gaze and protection. All quite different in role and purpose, which God has given us, but does not coincide with each other for a reason, 
we can thank God for us being inspired and challenged in equal measure. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's all about the journey, not the destination. The sure and certain hope of eternal life in Christ Jesus. When we pass from darkness to light, the time will come when Jesus will return and he will take us with him. The king will come as he always promised he will. Pre-Jesus, Simon was too emotional and impulsive to be worthy of the name of Peter. When the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, Peter drew his sword and cut off a soldier's ear. The boldness disappeared when he risked being arrested himself. Pre-Jesus, Simon was a brash fisherman with mouth and choices, got him into trouble. Post-Jesus, Peter returned to Christ, renewed in his love of Jesus, bedrock preacher of the early church, healer of the sick and lame, author of two New Testament books and fearless until death because Jesus makes us what we are not. As we started with Jesus, let us end with Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please forgive us for not always seeing your love for us in our day-to-day -day life. And that it takes us time to recognise the Holy Spirit working in our hearts and transforming us. Thank you that you love us. And that it is your mission to continue to deliver us from evil. And that Jesus' victory has saved us from the second death. Thank you that we can talk to you whenever we want in joy and in desperation. In your son Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>